African violets. African violets are one of my favorite plants. It is one of the most popular uh, house plants. Um, its ability, one of the reasons it's so po popular is that its ability to survive in just about any, any condition. And in most homes, it was first introduced in the United States in 1894. And most of the time, most people sell uh, or purchase hot African violets as an impulse item or as a gift. However, there's an intense, an intense um, culture or clubs and groups that raise and breed African violets. And they show them. And some of the best shows that you'll ever go to is the local garden club African violet shows and such that because these people pride themselves in having the latest, greatest cultivar and the most beautiful plants. Um, it was introduced into the United States in 1894 by George Stump, who is a florist. And uh, the seed uh, was first imported in 1927 uh, for the first commercial production. Um, the first commercial production of African violets in the United States was on a very small scale. And it uh, was through transplants where people would um, sell the transplants. But uh, today, there's only a few, a handful of really large growers that are uh, propagating and producing. And they're doing one, over one million plants a year on a regular basis. The primary marketing holidays for African violets are St. Valentine's Day, Easter, Mother's Day, the typical um, days. And, but it's also very popular and very easy to get them any time of the year. Now, the African violet has an interesting history. Uh, it was a pretty recent discovery. Um, discovered in 1892 um, in Eastern Africa by Baron Walter von St. Paul. We call it St. Paulia. Um, St. Paul brought them, he was the ger uh, German governor of Eastern Africa at the time, and brought the plants uh, or seeds to um, his father in Germany. And uh, er Hermann Wendland in the Royal Botanical Gardens in Germany named the genus after St. Paul. And um, the parent, uh, Ionetha and Confusa, St. Pauli Ionetha and St. Pauli Confusa, are the parents or the, parent, the genetic source, the genetic uh, orig origination of most of the cultivars that are sold today. And this is a, what a seedling St. Pauli Confusa looks like. Um, one of John Evans from Miss University of Minnesota's pictures. Now, some of the history, um, this is a particular species uh, was uh, in, found in the mountains in um, Eastern Africa. And it was first discovered during the German colonial periods of that particular part of the continent. And um, they had a, a, uh, an experiment station to study plants and see what would survive in those, in those hills trying to put together a uh, agronomic culture. They were looking at coffee, tea, cardamom, black pepper, these sorts of things. That's what they're studying there. And this particular part of Tanzania in the Usambara Mountains has native plants that are rare and native plants that are not found anywhere else in the world. And this is where the St. Paulia, the ancestral African violet, uh, was, lo was discovered. And um, it um, native to those heavy, dense forests. So the, the heavy shade, and that's, that's where they survive and thrived. And during the 1970s, there was an effort through a partnership between Finland and Tanzania to start this huge logging campaign. And they were actually able to block that logging project in this region and founded the Amani Botanic Gardens, which is now a national park in Tanzania, to protect that part of the rainforest. So African violet is typically thought of as the plant that sold the saved part of the African rainforest. Now, how did it get to be America's favorite house plant? In the 1920s and 30s, uh, Herman Holtkamp moved to uh, this country and started uh, the bringing on species and, and cultivars, developing cultivars that would not drop their flowers as fast, have um, 
continuous blooming and uh, work in these things. And the Holtkamp family uh, established the brand Optimera, which is heavily established today. If you were to go to any retail store and find African Violet, I can almost promise you that it will have the Optimera logo on it. Um, prior to the 1970s, the Holtkamp greenhouse only sold African Violets through licensed prop propagators. Um, and, but he, the son of Herman Holtkamp Sr. Uh, moved the main operation to Nashville, Tennessee and established the Optimera label. And today it is the largest African violet grower in the country and it is located in Nashville and they located Nashville primarily so they could ship centrally all over the country. African violets, uh, they're not compatible to grow with other greenhouse crops because they have special requirements. They have low light requirements and the night temperatures and the day temperatures are basically the same. We want, they have a warm night requirement. Remember this came from the forest floor in Tanzania. So we have to have good temperature and humidity, humidity control. Those that grow African violets on a commercial basis grow African violets only in that section. Those that retail or, or, or re-wholesale African violets actually have section, separate sections of the greenhouse where they can keep them in good quality shape. Night temperature 68 to 70. Uh, vegetative growth ideally 75 to 80. The average daily temperature of 77 degrees Fahrenheit gives you the best unfolding rate. It's pretty warm. Uh, greater than 85. If it gets too hot, the plants start to, the flowers start to stretch and they don't grow uh, they don't grow well. And if we sl get the temperature below 65, it doesn't grow well either. You probably, uh, a lot of people in Colorado grow African violets in their windows. In the wintertime, the windows are too cold. So it has a tendency to give us uh, problems in the home. Uh, propagation areas are two to four degrees warmer at night than in production areas. So this is a fairly warm temperature crop. And if you are going to grow it, you're going to grow it in a specialized environment and a lot on a small area. Under bench heating is the best for African violets. Um, if during the, the flat and plug stages, if we're propagating them, that's when they're going to grow the best. Substrate temperature is 68. Um, anything colder than 68 will reduce the production time. Uh, I mean, Maintaining the temperature at 68 degrees or higher will reduce the production time. Lower than 68 degrees will reduce the plant quality. So bottom heat is essential with African violets. So the production stages of an African violet, um, when we're going to bloom it, the buzz, the, the, you're going to see the visible leaf bud when it's about two millimeters long and the flower stalk itself the peduncle is going to elongate and then it's going to bend over slightly and when it completely curves the inflorescence starts to come out and straighten up and that's when the primary flowers open. Typically it's sold or marketed when there are five flowers open per plant. The days to visible bud um, is very temperature related and the inflorescence development stages one through eight depending on how far they, along they are in their production cycle. These are the production stages. One through eight. Nine is this point we're going to sell it. So here you can determine how many days you have at the individual temperatures to predict when you can market that crop. And those that are selling African violets have a pretty good handle on how to tweak their greenhouse temperatures to slow it up, speed it up, to um, harvest at the appropriate time. Light, like I said, um, these are forest floor species. They're shade adapted. Um, light intensity does have some to do with uh, flower initiation, number of flowers. We need 800 to 1200 foot candles in the middle of the day, which is a long ways from 3000 to 5000 foot candles. Temperature and seasons, uh, during the winter, um, a lot of people will give a little bit higher light intensities to give more number of hours if the natural day period is short. 
In fact, most hobby growers of African violets will light their African violets 24-7. This was the original basement crop. In fact, we, I know at least one episode where a little old lady had her door battered in in Boulder County because she had a basement crop of African violets. The Sheriff's Department was very embarrassed. If the light is too bright, the leaves are going to be brittle and they're going to be hard, they're going to be short and bleached. They're going to have, if, without, if you don't have enough light, you're going to have long skinny petioles, thin leaves and few flowers. So it's a fine line of which you can do. Shading to keep it dark, in the light lower in the summertime. Automated sh shade systems work really well gives you a finer degree of your light intensity to help control your bloom cycle. Like I said, uh, artificial light has been popular for a long time. Um, in fact, some growers use multi-layered benching systems for propagation and finishing where we're actually growing under the bench to give multi-layered to increase your square footage to give you a uh, higher return per square foot. So if they're doing un, uh, double layer benches, oftentimes they'll install some fluorescent fixtures or something like that. Um, you can improve the fluorescent fixtures by adding incandescent lights to about 10% of the total wattage with the fluorescent fixtures so to give you a better balance. Um, HID uh, sodium vapor lamps work well as well. Humidity, they grow best 50 to 70 percent, a little bit on the low side. Um, if the light intensity is high, you're going to have to keep the humidity a little higher. During the winter months, uh, we want to avoid high humidity conditions to avoid foliar diseases. They do get a, a boost in plant growth if we inject carbon dioxide and um, you can also, if you inject carbon dioxide, you can grow at lower light intensity and just get a, bit, a little bit better uh, production. Um, again, the basement growers will inject a little CO2 out of a tank, get a little best, better, better production. Like I said, this is the original basement crop. Now, African violets have a very fine textured root system. And they require a very well aerated, very well drained mix, high in organic matter. We want to avoid high, high salts. It needs to be well leached. Um, and some of the, uh, the Cornell mixes, if you'll see that in the literature, that's, that's a regular vermiculite peat moss mix, very fine, uh, fine textured. Some people will add a little bit of perlite to give it a little more aeration. Dolomitic limestone to bring it up to 5.8 to 6.2. And we typically will put only low rates of micronutrients or phosphates in the potting soil. And we're going to try to give as much of the fertilizer as we can through the fertilizer uh, irrigation feed. They're light feeders. If you over fertilize them, they will get brittle. Um, but they like a steady, sta steady uh, source. We're never going to fertilize them more than 125 parts per million. Most people use sub-irrigation on, Af on African violets, so it's even going to be less. We want to keep the electrical conductivity of our soil extract very low, 0.8 to 0.9. So this is about half the fertility of a lot of other crops. This is w another reason why African violets are not compatible with other crops that are heavy feeders, because there's not a heavy feeders. We don't want to put any fertilizer on the pot until the roots, if we're transplanting the cuttings, until the roots touch the side of the pot and grow down to the bottom of the pot. Again, they're very sensitive to overfeeding. Okay, um, we want to keep the uh, root substrate uniformly moist but not saturated. They don't like wet dry cycles but they don't like wet feet. So if you let it go to the, to the, to the, to tend to dry out a little bit, it's going to stunt. If the soluble salt electrical conductivity is too high, you're going to burn the foliage and uh, they need oxygen. 
If you're going to water overhead, a couple things need to happen. The water temperature needs to be the same temperature as the foliage, so it doesn't burn. Most people avoid that. Excuse me. Um, if the water is too cold or too hot, you're going to get the ring spots. So uh, what most people try to do is do a sub-irrigation practice. African violet, they can be propagated from seed, but typically only the, only the, the breeders will do seed from seed because they don't come true to seed. They'll revert back to one of the parents, typically the female parent. Uh, most people propagate by leaf cuttings or leaf petiole cuttings. You can do some division. Uh, tissue culture, they come really easy for tissue culture. Uh, African violets are uh, one of the easiest plants there is to learn tissue culture. Um, those that are propagating from leaf cuttings will maintain stock, stock plants in a large area. And, uh, but most of the commercial cultivars that are being sold are patented. And you should not be propagating without a license or ownership or paying royalties for that patent. So what they'll do is they'll do uh, stick the, the leaves in a flat. Uh, they're selected from stock plants that have good green color. Uh, you need to have um, one and a quarter to one and three quarter inch long leaves. The petioles, uh, ideally, trim it to a half an inch and insert it into the medium. And we don't want the leaves to touch each other. In propagation, where we're starting to miss things, we, if the leaves touch each other, that's going to cause water to sit someplace and cause a little bit of a bacterial infection. Uh, takes place in about two weeks, and we get plantlets from the base of the petiole or the base of the leaf vein if we're actually cutting uh, the leaf up. The mother leaf is then removed once it starts to um, root and the plantlet is coming up. We're going to remove the mother leaf so it doesn't shade the plant and also so it doesn't uh, hold the plant back with any kinds of uh, hormones or uh, apical dominance or anything like that. Now, at this point, if it's rooted in and we've removed the mother leaf, we can give it a little bit of a fertility shot of fertilizer to get it off and growing. And it's usually 14 to 16 weeks, depending on uh, the whole process of what time of year it is and how cold the soil is. So here's an example of some leaf cuttings in uh, cells where um, they've stuck the leaves into, the, into these little cells, which is probably the most common form of propagation for African violets. We, take, we do the transplant when there's three to five mature leaves, and we're going to pop them into separate crowns. And we're, what the growers will do is they'll then grade them into different sizes, because the size of the plantlet that's coming off is going to give you some, uh, it's going to be reflected in the vigor of the plant. So they'll either grade them by hand or sized, but most people use a, an automated system where they're actually grading the cuttings by how much they weigh. Plantlets are then uh, put into plug flats and finished off in uh, finished pots depending on the market they're going for. Now, the most common African violet size that's being in the market is a four inch pot. Uh, sometimes we see four and a half and fives. Not, uh, six inches are, are not common. Uh, we're going to take them um, on the bench. Uh, we're going to put them for the first five to six weeks uh, after we transplant the plantlets into the pots, grow them can tight, pot to pot, so that they grow occupying as least space as possible to get the ma maximum production. And then uh, we'll move them to uh, an area for finishing when the flowers begin to appear, where we'll be putting about uh, four plants per square foot. And we're going to put them at this point on ebb and flood or capillar capillary mats. We ship them when they've got five blooms open. That's at stage nine we saw earlier. And the pro total production time from leaf cutting to a finished pot is 32 to 36 weeks. So that's a long time, but that's from the unrooted leaflet to sale. This is an African violet. Um, um, this is actually at Optimera, I believe, and uh, where they, are, um, use it, they use a lot of mechanical devices to 
space and load the benches. These these benches are the are the Dutch style that move in and out of the greenhouse. It's an ebon flood bench, ebon flood table. Um, conveyor system where the plants are being moved to their finished stage for the with the conveyor system. They go through a sensor that determines how big the plant is and the size of the pot. Um, this little gadget um, has, uh, before this point, there's a, right here on the left outside the screen, there's a barcode scanner. It's identifying the plant and the cultivar and uh, it's being moved onto the conveyor belt. This little lever will push it onto the next conveyor belt. And depending on the uh, bench and part of the greenhouse it needs to go to, the computer will control uh, which bench that it'll then move on to. This is a picture of um, the uh, chamber where the computer takes a picture of the barcode and also a picture of the plant to determine how, uh, what stage of growth it's, it's at. And some more pictures moving down the conveyor systems. So like I said, the Holt Camp operation is very large, very automated, um, very fun place to visit. Other growers that, that do African violets, this is an African violet production uh, facility um, where they've, they're using, these are the small uh, pots, these are the two inch pots, and they're actually put in a tray to support them so they don't tip, and they're placed on an ebb and flood bench as well. They don't handle the conveyors systems the same way. And this is a crop full of African violets. The one on the right is ready to go to market. The one on the left is about two to three weeks away from going to market. So a little bit of a time frame. Again, when we're scheduling our crop, we, we look at the finish date and we work backwards. And depending on the kind of production cycle that you're working on, if you're bringing in uh, potted cuttings, uh, or rooted cuttings or rooted plantlets, you're probably at the point where you're finishing your crop is anywhere in the middle. African violets in the retail uh, homes such as that. Here we can see an example where they've, they've this grower this has got his, uh, their African violets growing under fluorescent lights in the shady part of the retail center. Um, this particular retail center, they've got them in a shaded area, but they're also, they put their um, African violets in these uh, saucers so they can water them from the bottom. And that's the story of an African violet. <laughs>